G'day, I'm Paul. So I own a Tesla Model Y. They've just launched this, which is the performance version. So it's been available overseas for a while now, but it is new to Australia and it's now joining the base Model Y in addition to the long range in the lineup. And I thought, let's have a drive of it, see what it's like from a Model Y owner's point of view and whether it is worth actually upgrading. This also has a new comfort suspension that was fitted to these after I got mine delivered. So I'll be really keen to see what that's like to drive as well. This competes with things like the Kia EV6 GT and the uh, Ionic 5N, which will be launched later this year. It has kind of been unique in this segment as a performance SUV uh, that is now sort of joined by other brands as well. It's priced at a little under $95,000, but if that's too expensive, the whole range kicks off at just under 70 grand. Today, we're gonna to do a detailed review of the Blue Rocket. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, I'd really appreciate it if you can subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we drive a new Tesla or I report on my Tesla. Okay, so let's start with the exterior. This is available in five different colors. All but white is going to cost you extra with red being the most expensive color. I really like this blue. It looks great in person, especially on these black wheels as well. I think it looks really nice. Um, in terms of the visual differences, you can actually get the base model Y in Australia with the 20 inch alloy wheels that look very similar to this. So sometimes when you do spot these on the road, just because it has this style of wheel, it doesn't mean that it is the performance. You can tell the performance aside from the others because it's got dual motor on the back with an underline. And you also have red brakes here as well. In terms of the rest of the design, um, Australia's lagging behind the rest of the world at the moment, and I, I don't know why, but Tesla is actually removing parking sensors on the front and the rear of their cars and instead relying only on Tesla Vision to process all of your parking distances. So far, the results of that have been pretty terrible. Um, a guy in the UK published a video um, an independent guy uh, published a video about how bad the parking sensors are under vision. The good news though is that Tesla obviously updates its software very regularly so it means that that stuff should improve over time but ultimately I don't know why they didn't just stick with these. These work perfectly fine and they have for years. Uh, in terms of the rest of the design, it's all pretty straightforward down the front. There you've got the Tesla logo up the top there. You've got this lower section here for cooling and then also the headlights. So they are full LED headlights. They are auto high beam. That function, certainly in my Model Y, just doesn't work at all. And it's pretty frustrating because often it'll blind drivers in high beam when they're approaching you. Uh, sometimes it won't switch the high beams on when there's no one in front of you. And then the, I guess the most frustrating part about it is that if you do have autopilot set at night, it defaults to automatic high beams. And because it doesn't work very well, you kind of just don't end up using autopilot at night because you don't want to blind other drivers. This actual cluster though has functionality for matrix LEDs. So they've got the whole setup there that they need. I think it's just a software limitation at the moment and um, hopefully something they can roll out pretty soon. Let's whip around to the side here. By the way, throughout this review, I'm going to sprinkle in some stuff about my ownership and, uh, and what it's like and how it should compare to your upcoming ownership. Uh, Tesla is upgrading the camera quality in these as well. So it's going from a camera that I think was under two megapixels to one that's around five megapixels. So it'll mean better processing for the car's computers and also better recording for things like sentry footage, which I'll run you through later on. Down the side here, you've got 21 inch alloy wheels and they're on a pretty sporty tire. So this car has a set of Pirelli P0s on it. I think I've seen other cars with uh, Pilot Sports. You can tell the performance aside from others with these red brakes. So up the front, here it's a four piston caliper on a 355 mil rotor this is a brembo brake the rears used to be brembo as well and i'll explain what has changed over there in just a second i really do like this wheel design though that matte finish looks sensational just be careful of curbs though because if you do gutter ash these there really isn't much clearance there you're going to absolutely destroy them but they look fantastic there in person so a little camera here for your side camera there's also an indicator built into there as well up the top here, you'll notice there is no indicator in this wing mirror like they do in a lot of other cars. There's also no camera under there as well because this doesn't have a 360 camera, which is a little bit disappointing in my opinion, um, given most other cars in this price bracket do have that technology. The door handles, uh, I've talked about this in other Tesla products as well, but you push that and then pull the door handle and that opens the car. I like the fact that this is all black around here as well. Really gives it a nice sort of uh, covert design camera built into here as well. This is also where you tap the key when you lock and unlock the car. Based on my ownership experience though, I don't, even, I don't think I even know where my key card is. Uh, I just use the phone to unlock the car all the time. So that's where you tap it. Privacy glass, you get a full glass roof as well. Now, the rear brakes, let me run you through these. So 
Tesla did a bit of a dodgy. So they used to have Brembo front and rear brakes. Now they've gone down the path of a non-Brembo brake at the rear. As a result of that, uh, they've put this dress cover over it to make it look like the old one, but it is actually different. Not that big of a deal given uh, with EVs, they're gonna be doing a lot of regen and most of your braking is through the front uh, axle anyway. So not the end of the world, but yeah, a little bit frustrating. Um, okay, so come around to the back of the car with me. So around the back here, sorry the car's so dirty, it was raining this morning. Um, you have full LED tail lights. This is the mention that I made earlier of that red underline on dual motor. That gives you an idea that this is in fact the performance variant. You get this uh, carbon, I don't know if it's real carbon, but carbon-esque um, boot lip on the back there. And then the rest is sort of pretty straightforward. If you do fit a tow bar, this section here pops out and that's where your tow bar sits. It has a brake towing capacity of 1600 kilograms and then you have that lower diffuser down there as well so um, let me know what you reckon about this model y performance so if you have a look at something like a kia ev6 gt it kind of looks the same as the rest of the ev6 range that's what tesla's done here with the model y it kind of just looks like any other model y unless you know exactly what you're looking for i think the ionic 5n will look different so that they've gone down the path of giving it a bit more sort of substance and presence. So I'll be keen to see what that finally looks like, but let me know what you reckon about the Model Y performance down in the comments section below. Okay, so we are inside the Model Y performance. Um, I'd start off with the key at this point, but there is no key. It actually all just runs through your phone. And I'm gonna quickly just mention just how good this app is. So I have a Ford Ranger Raptor and we've got our Model Y. The Ford app, in comparison to the Tesla app is terrible. Like anything I do on the Ford app takes forever to get to the car. With the Tesla app, I can like just literally press a button here and it will happen immediately. So for example, watch this, you've got that on pause. I'll hit play, it starts like immediately after. Volume. Like it is just an unreal setup and it means that when you do come to the car to unlock it, you literally grab the door handle, it unlocks the car immediately. There's no waiting around. And in terms of other functions of the app, you have the ability to look at the live camera view. So when sentry mode is running, you can actually see what's happening at the front, back and sides of the car. Uh, in addition to that, you can control everything from the app, from opening and closing the car, giving people permission to drive the car. Uh, even though they don't have the key, you can set a pin to drive the car, open and close the door, honk the horn, flash the lights, set all your charging speeds. Uh, you can even send navigation destinations to the car. So from Google Maps, I can basically uh, send a destination to the car. So the second I get in, it's navigating to that location. Uh, you can schedule your charging. You can also set things like speed limits here valet mode, uh, and then you can also uh, buy some of the upgrades for the car here as well. So it is an excellent app, and this is probably one of my favorite features of the car. The rest of this stuff is pretty cool, but this app really sets this vehicle apart from anything else on the road. It is amazing. So um, I'll put that down. Um, let's talk about uh, some of the materials they use here. So in our first Tesla, we had a Model 3 Performance. Uh, we went with the wide interior. I liked it, the seats were actually pretty easy to keep clean, but I would have preferred this open pore wood grain trim. The white just gets this sort of cheap looking stuff that sits around here that is white. This setup is much better with the black seats because you get the open pore wood grain and to me, it looks just a little bit nicer. The materials around the cabin have improved significantly as well. So throwing back to our Model 3 performance, it had a, a sort of piano black finish and it was very hard to keep clean. It scratched really easily. They did away with that and went down the path of this matte finish. You can even see here with these charging pads for the phone, these have like an Alcantara trim on them as well. So really like the way that looks. All of this stuff here is soft to the touch, even though you're not gonna to be touching this all that often, that's soft to the touch as well. Um, so all of that stuff is really great and it looks and feels nice and premium. What about your build quality? So um, this car, I've sort of poked around it and the build quality is excellent. Our car has had no issues with build quality either. I think those days are behind Tesla. They're now building cars that are really well assembled and that don't really have the dramas they used to have when they started doing all of this. So I think that is all gone. Um, what about our door slam? So this is one of the things I don't love about the car because it doesn't have the frame around the door there. When you do close it, it's got a bit of a tinny sound to it. It sounds a little bit cheap, so it's probably something that hopefully one day they can improve. In terms of actually opening and closing the door, you have a button up the top here that releases the door. Then you have an emergency release there as well to open it if you do ever lose power to the car. But there is a slight problem with the second row that I'll run you through in, a, in just a moment. Okay, let's talk infotainment. It's pretty much the only electronic thing to talk about here because uh, everything is controlled here on the screen or on the steering wheel. So 
This will probably be the detail overload, but I'll just run you through a lot of this stuff and, and what I appreciate as functions of the car. So here on the sort of default home screen, you have your satellite navigation. So this uses Google Maps, and you can see here that you can go satellite overlays. You can also include traffic or exclude traffic, depending on where you are. And then if you zoom in, you kind of get more detail in terms of where you are and, and what's sort of happening around you. You can then hit this button here as well that immediately tells you where the um, superchargers are. It's worth keeping in mind as well that it doesn't always just show you Tesla superchargers. So you can actually see other brands in here as well. It sort of varies in terms of what it'll show you de depending on a set of criteria that Tesla has. And you can also set the different charge speeds you want to see here as well. So you can see how sort of effective that is and then I'll route you through to the supercharger. If you do actually select a faster DC charger this will start preheating the battery on your journey as well so it can charge a little bit quicker as it goes which I'm a big fan of. Um, in terms of navigation and stuff it is very quick and easy and just works. So you put in the, the destination, whether it's an address or a place, it'll find it and then it'll navigate to there. If you do need to charge along the way, it will tell you uh, where you need to go to charge. I love this as well. So profiles, uh, because I own a Tesla, it shows up here my profile. And this profile is actually synced to our other car. So when I select that, it will recall every other setting that I have in our other car. So it means that I can switch between different cars, even if they're not my own, sign into my profile, and then it will bring up all of those settings just for me, which I think is pretty cool. This little thing up here indicates that sentry mode's running. So that's the feature that will basically record around you if it detects an impact or motion around the car. I love it because if someone runs into you while you're not there, it'll record it all to the USB stick that sits inside the glove box. So it's there forever. And uh, it means that you have evidence if anything goes wrong. It's also uh, a dash cam function too. So once you've done driving, you can actually pull up all of that footage as well and, and um, download it if you need to. Uh, other functions you have here, they store all of your favorites down the bottom. You can adjust the order of these as well. But only through just the audio system, you have Spotify, and you basically get as part of a premium package, which you have to pay, I think it's around $10 a month for, you get access to Spotify. And that means you can listen to anything you want, basically. You just search for it, start playing it, and away you go. In terms of other audio sources, you have Bluetooth radio, which has uh, FM and DAB digital radio. You have karaoke, Tidal, TuneIn, and now Apple Music as well. There is no Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, which I'm a little bit miffed by, I reckon they just need to add that in because I use things like Waze and, and it's just much easier to do on Apple CarPlay than it is on here. So if we flick down over here to that full menu, uh, this is where you access the dash cam so you can start recalling uh, footage from around you. You can see this is, um, this is us right now and then before the car was plugged up to the charger. Um, you can also then pull up all your sentry mode stuff as well. In here as well, you're going to find your energy maps. So this is a really sort of fascinating feature because what it does is it tells you how much energy you've consumed and how much it predicted you would consume. So it's saying here that we used 11 kilometers less than the trip projection simply because we were able to optimize things like driving and climate. Whereas if you are driving up a hill, for example, if I drive from Melbourne to Ballarat, it's, it's an elevation change that goes up. You see here that it eats into your uh, driving range and it means that you're actually using more energy than the car is saying that you're using. So I think this is a, an interesting feature. It's a bit sort of um, pointless if you're chewing through too much energy because ultimately you'll find out about it after and there's not really a great deal you can do about it. So um, in addition to that down here, you've got calendar, which you can sync with your phone messages. Um, that functionality and the voice recognition functionality really doesn't work very well. It just has no understanding of what you're saying. So often when you ask it to do something, it'll just do the opposite of what you think it's going to do. You then have other features that, to be honest, I don't really use as an owner. So a lot of people say, well, you use these while you're charging, but I just plug the car in at home. So I don't really sit there watching things, but you can do uh, Netflix, Disney, YouTube, Twitch, and there's um, tutorials there. And then you have games as well that you can play while you're sitting inside the car. And then other silly features like fart modes and, and 
all this other stuff. So that, that is where you um, access those functions. And outside of that, you have a web browser built into here. It's not the best browser because it's a bit slow and, and clunky, so it doesn't really work that well. Um, and the rest of the functions here I've already spoken about. I know I've spoken a lot here, but um, I'll just run you through the last sort of basics. When you are driving, you'll see here that this display changes a little bit. It'll show what's going on around us. You can also switch between percentages and driving range up the top there. Climate control functions are all done through this screen here. A lot of people have complained about um, adjustment of air vents and that it is fiddly, but to be honest, you adjust them once when you get the car and you never really touch them again. So that's not really something I've had too much of a drama with. Um, you then have other features for your climate controls, such as keeping the climate running, overheat protection. You have dog mode, camp mode as well. And then you can adjust front and rear climate. You have head seats, front two seats, and also all three rear seats and the steering wheel as well. So yeah, it is a pretty, um, pretty awesome setup there and, and all sort of fairly straightforward to use. I don't love the fact that it is quite fiddly to use while you're driving and we'll run through that when we do go for a drive. I'll give you an example of some of that stuff. Um, and then finally, uh, I promise, is all of the settings for the car which you can change through here so you can sort of go through and, and adjust everything as you go. Now, the last thing I want to show you is something I literally only just stumbled across last night. And just from an engineer and tech point of view, I reckon it is bloody cool. So if you go down here to uh, software and you push and hold this on dual motor, it comes up asking for an access code. And if you type in service, it enters the car's service mode. Once it's in that mode, you get some incredible stats. So you can see the vehicle's VIN, odometer reading, the firmware that it's running and that type of thing. But in here, you can just do a stack of really fascinating things. I love this. If I go down to the thermal controls, have a look at this. How cool is that? So it's basically now telling us while the cooling system is running, how all of the interior components are operating, the temperatures, what the compressor's doing, and if you go over here to the refrigerant system, you can see it all moving around the car there. Coolant system as well. It is seriously cool. And then you go over here to charging. You can actually do a battery test to see what your 12 volt and your high voltage battery is like. You can get a better idea of how healthy it all is. Just a really great setup. And um, I love the fact that as an owner, you can actually play with some of this stuff and get a better idea of it. It is obviously designed here just for the service personnel. And if you do play with anything here you might break stuff but I just love the fact that you can play with this stuff if you do want to. Um, I'll also just quickly point out the sound system as well. Um, yeah I test a lot of cars and this is well and truly one of the best standard sound systems you will hear in a new car today. It is absolutely unreal. So you have 13 speakers, one subwoofer, two amplifiers, like it's some proper stuff. So when you do crank the beats, it, it is quite an immersive experience. So really big fan of that. And if you are a fan of your audio, you're going to love the sound system as well. Let's talk safety tech. So uh, Tesla's done away with radar and now uses just Tesla Vision, which is all the camera systems. Um, I, I've got to be honest, it doesn't really work that well uh, in the sense that when you're using cruise control, which is now controlled by the camera system, and this is just standard autopilot, you can spend something like $10,000 on uh, full self-driving, which is uh, where it changes lanes for you and stuff. Um, we had the chance to test that out over Christmas, and um, it was, I'm genuinely shocked it's actually available in the car because it was so bad. Um, so yeah, it's something they might fix over time, but yeah, I just would not bother wasting 10 grand on it. The car does come standard with autopilot, which is effectively radar cruise control just without a radar. So it'll hold lane centering for you and keep a set distance between you and the car in front. Problem is it's quite indecisive. Um, I have uh, semi-occasional phantom braking issues with our Model Y, had phantom braking issues with the Model 3 as well. So that means when you approach like an overpass or something, it'll think it's a stationary object and it'll hit the brakes. Um, there was even a guy that um, in Sydney, his car tried to slam the brakes on for a pedestrian that wasn't like in front of the car at all and he caused a pileup. Um, so yeah, it is a system that you need to be watching all the time and I'm always ready to take over because I, I just don't trust that it's going to work well. It also does strange things like when you are following another car and you go to pass it by putting the indicator on, 
it doesn't do what a regular radar system does, which is check the next lane, see that it's free, and then start accelerating. And I think we'll actually try and demo this later on so you can get a bit of an idea of what I'm talking about. So um, yeah, that stuff kind of really needs to work better. But it does have autonomous emergency braking forwards. It doesn't have it in reverse, which is disappointing. Most new cars on the market today have um, rear cross traffic alert, which is a radar-based system. Obviously, this not using radar doesn't have that. It also doesn't have any blind spot monitoring, which is, again, pretty disappointing because when you put your indicator on, you get the camera come up but I would prefer to just have a blind spot monitor running in the wing mirror, which is where you need to be doing a head check regardless. Uh, it also now, if you're ordering one today, no longer has front and rear parking sensors, which I mentioned earlier. Um, on the camera front though, it does have uh, a sort of parking set up here when you do pop it into reverse. So I'll show you what that looks like. So it's actually, the camera itself is really high quality. So you can see there, I can clearly see what my suitcase says. Um, those guidelines move with the steering wheel. Now this view is interesting. So that's looking back down the side of the car. Typically what you would do is set your wing mirror to, to dip down so you can see how close you are to the curb. But this view is actually great because when you're reversing into the curb, you can see exactly where it is. And it's it's just a really seamless system. And I find that um, this kind of array is, is fantastic. And then when you pair it with this car, which has the ultrasonic sensors, you can really park quite easily without too many dramas. And this is what the horn sounds like. <coughs> Let's talk about practicality and we'll start off with your connectivity. So I mentioned before, you have wireless phone charging down the front here, which works well. In here, you have another set of USB-C ports. So there's two of them in there. You also have a 12 volt outlet in here. In terms of storing things, so your phone can live there on the charger or in the cup holders. The cup holders, so this is what it looks like. So in terms of putting your coffee in, Fits okay in there, doesn't get delittered, which is great news. And then in terms of our water bottle, fits in there, but there are no teeth, so it kind of just moves around a little bit. It does fit inside the door pocket. Let's try our big bottle as well, see how that goes. Yeah, that fits in there too, which is good news. Now, in terms of other storage, have a look at this. You have just so much storage. You've got this giant slot down here that you can stick a whole bunch of stuff in. Your center console is enormous as well. And then you also have a glove box in here too, which also has your USB port for the dash cam and the sentry mode as well. And that's sort of reasonably sized. Okay, now comfort, let's chat about that. You have dual zone automatic climate control up the front here. You also have heated seats for the front row, heated steering wheel. The seats themselves, um, are really comfortable. I've spent a fair bit of time in this car and um, yeah, that's one of the things I love about it. The seats are just nice and soft and supportive. In terms of adjustment, so you, they're both electrically adjustable. You can go forwards, backwards, backrest can go forwards, backwards. You can lift the front, you can lift the back. You also have lumbar adjustment for the driver. They did have lumbar adjustment for the passenger, but they deleted that feature because they said um, it wasn't used very often something you set once and then don't use, but the fact that it's not there, I think is just bizarre. In fact, it's actually one of the things that kind of annoys me with Tesla. So they've removed that. Now they remove the carpet that's in the front. So it kind of has no grip on it when you put stuff in there. They remove the mobile connector, which used to be standard. You actually used to get a wall connector, <laughs> part of the car purchase price as well. So they are just cutting these things out as they go and it does get a little bit frustrating over time because you lose things that you think should actually be standard. So um, in terms of steering adjustment, it's electrically adjustable and it's all done here through the screen. Uh, so you basically set this and then you can basically move it up and down using the controls there on the steering wheel. It offers both tilt and reach adjustment. And this is also where you adjust your mirrors to using the same function there on the steering wheel. Okay. Second row of the Model Y. Um, this is probably the thing that I love about this vehicle the most. When we stepped up from Model 3 to Model Y, look at the room in here. Like, to be honest, it is a strange looking car on the outside. And I know that design is subjective, but that strange look really affords them all of this space. So my seat is pretty much all the way back and I've got loads of knee room. Toe room is ridiculously good. Headroom is excellent as well. And you get this massive glass roof here. The only downside to this glass roof is that on really hot days, it radiates so much heat into the cabin and it really does struggle to keep everything cool in here because you're just constantly getting barraged with heat. Um, so I really wish there was like a cover 
that came standard with this. You have to uh, buy it. It's optional. You've got to go pay for that if you want it, but um, at least there is a solution in place there. Other creature comforts, you have map pockets in the back of the seats, two USB-C ports, air vents here as well. Seat heating for all three seats. Uh, Isofix points with three top tether points. You have a center armrest here with two cup holders. They have uh, rubber teeth on them, so you can just bottle in there if you want to. And then you also have the ability to drop this center section down as well to give you access to the boot if you need to. Now, something I did mention in our last Model Y review that I'm not a fan of, but they have kind of addressed is this situation here. So that's the button to release the door. You push that, the door comes open, but that needs power to work. If in the event you're in a car accident or something happens where that button is no longer active, there's no emergency release here like there is at the front. It's located down here underneath this piece of rubber and then you've got a little button that you have to get out of the way and then under there is like a little tab that you have to pull. It's the most ridiculous process in the world and I don't understand why I couldn't have just integrated it here so that you can just get out if you need to. Um, so that is a little bit disappointing that you do have so much of a faff around there. Um, but on the other hand, it is handy. Uh, I've got my daughter that sits in this seat in our car. She can now reach this button here and uh, that's obviously not good when you come to a stop. So uh, the workaround is on the screen, you can actually set your child locks to be uh, both doors or one door. And I think that is just a great feature because you have it permanently set on her side. And that means she won't be, won't be able to do anything with that button uh, if she does actually end up reaching it. Finally, our window test. It's auto up and down. Will it go all the way? Mm, no, not quite. Now let's talk cargo capacity. This is probably my favorite thing about the Model Y. We upgraded to a Model Y from a Model 3 because we needed uh, more room for our little girl. And trust me, it doesn't disappoint. So you've got around 850 liters of cargo space available here just in the standard form. The reason this is so much better than the Model 3 is the Model 3's boot kind of opens like that and you can't really get a great deal in. Well, you can for, for a sort of sedan, but this is just such a big space and you can really just chuck a whole heap of stuff in there. So it doesn't come with a cargo blind, but I think you can get one aftermarket. Beneath the cargo floor here, look at that. That is a huge space. So this is where you can stick things like charging cables. And if you do go for a road trip, you literally just load that thing up as much as you can and you're all set. Over on either side, you have even more storage down the edges there. There's also this little storage nook up the front if you do need just that little bit of extra space as well. I'll show you what it looks like with the bags in there. So that's the laptop bag. That's the suitcase. I mean, you can picture a pram and all that sort of stuff in there. It all fits in really nicely. Then if you do want more space, you can drop the second row here from the back. It's a 40-20-40 it's a split fold, but then if you flick these levers, it will just get that completely out of the way. And that expands the space to over 2,000 litres. In addition to all of this, you also have storage up the front, a little over 100 litres of space. Love the front area because if you do go and pick up like a takeaway curry or something that's gonna stink out the car, stick it all in the front boot, drive home, and no one will ever know. There's no evidence. <laughs> Now, before we go for a drive, let's talk about charging and battery. So this is a little flap where your charging infrastructure is. Um, keep in mind as well with this, that if you do have a Tesla branded charger, you can just press the button on the charger and it opens this flap, or you just tap it like that, or open it in the car or in the app. So this offers both AC and DC charging. It'll do AC charging up to 11 kilowatts, three phase, and it'll do DC charging now, this is the funny thing. It, it does it up to 250 kilowatts, but it averages around 120 kilowatts. And I was a bit surprised by that. I thought it'd be much higher than that. When I actually tested this the other night, I um, preheated the battery, uh, ran the state of charge down to under 10%, plugged it up to a 350 kilowatt charger, and the maximum it'd pull is around 190 kilowatts. Same charger, uh, except with a Hyundai product with their 800 volt architecture, it actually averaged over 200 kilowatts. So I think that Tesla probably has a bit of work to do on the charging front and to get the charging speeds up to where some of the competitors are. And I think a lot of that just comes down to the fact that this still doesn't use 800 volt charging architecture. Keep in mind as well that battery size here, nominal size of just under 80 kilowatt. This is a lithium ion battery. It's not an LFP battery like you do have in the entry model car that, that I own. That means that with this, you're only really meant to charge this up to about 80 or 90% regularly uh, whereas with the LFP battery it's recommended to charge that to 100% constantly. I'll run you through why that makes a psychological difference uh, when we do hop in the car. 
Okay, so we have just hit the road in the Model Y Performance. Uh, before I even go into anything else, I want to talk about the ride. And this is the thing that I was most bitterly disappointed with uh, when we first drove the Model Y and when I picked up our personal car as well, because the ride is terrible. It is so firm, even on my car with the base 19 inch alloy wheels, it's overly firm and just totally unacceptable for a new car today, especially one that isn't meant to really be a sports car. The base model is just meant to be a comfortable family SUV. So the suspension's terrible, but Tesla has started fitting what they call a comfort damper to these cars. And I thought, eh, I don't know how convinced I am about that. And then when I hopped in this, it is like chalk and cheese compared to my car. So this uses the comfort damper. So despite this being on 21 inch alloy wheels with low profile tires, this has a far more comfortable ride than even our car on, uh, on the 19. So it isn't amazing. So it is still really firm and it doesn't have the variability that other cars in this segment do with adaptive damping like the um, EV6 GT and the upcoming Ionic 5N. And I think ultimately they do need that because that is where you're gonna notice most of the difference when it comes to, to driving around in this. But in comparison to what they had previously, this is a huge step forward. It's my understanding that they're gonna be fitting this same type of suspension to the rest of the Model Y range for Australia as well, but I haven't had that confirmed just yet because uh, no one at Tesla ever tells us anything. <laughs> So I mentioned earlier in terms of battery size, it's around that 80 kilowatt hour mark in terms of the nominal value. This then uses two electric motors, one on the front axle, one on the rear axle, and that produces a combined power output of just under 400 kilowatts of power and almost 700 Newton meters of torque, which is a big old wallop. Now that means when you do get on it, uh, it pins you back into the seat uh, very much more than you do in the base Model Y. That's uh, probably one thing that, that I miss with our Model 3 performance. The base Model Y is so slow in comparison. This is definitely much better there in terms of how quickly it picks up pace and gets moving. Now you may have noticed as well, this seat belt is on for the passenger seat and that is because a bit of a design flaw when it is in its normal position, there's a piece of plastic on the side of the seat there that houses the airbag and the seatbelt just constantly taps on it. So all you hear all the time is just tap, tap, tap from the seatbelt. So when there is no passenger in the car, you drive with this connected. So it's a little bit annoying uh, and it doesn't seem like there's a way to adjust it so that doesn't happen anymore. So we've talked about the ride being better. What is it like over the sine waves? Because when we tested uh, the base Model Y, it was excellent over the sine waves. It had really good body control. Let's see if we're getting the same experience here. So we will dial up 130 k's an hour we'll see how it goes. Wow, it's really feeling really wallowy through there. Uh, okay, so 130, here come the sine waves. Yeah, look, it's, it's not bad. Uh, it definitely feels not as good as the base Model Y. So obviously with the base Model Y having a firmer ride, it is able to control itself better there over the sine waves, whereas this has a bit more float to it. It's not the end of the world, but um, I have a feeling when we do go for a faster drive, it's probably going to affect the way that it handles. Now, our bumpy road. This is literally the worst road in Australia. We hit this at 90 k's an hour to see how the vehicle performs. Okie dokie, so there's 90 k's an hour. I can really hear something rattling around in the back there. It's actually quite impressive in terms of the ride. It is just so much better than, than my Model Y. Here's our condensed sine wave. That is remarkably good. It's really just falling into all of those divots nicely. And it's just coping really well with this, this sort of terrible road condition. So yeah, really impressive uh, sort of ride comfort and body control over these choppier stretches of road. Now let's talk about economy. So Tesla claims a combined consumption of just under 15 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. We are currently sitting on 19.2 kilowatt hours per 100 Ks. So keep in mind that includes a mix of highway driving to get here to the proving ground, plus some hot laps earlier in the day. So that's really quite impressive. When we did something like this in the EV6 GT, we were sitting at a much higher energy consumption there. Um, what amazes me, my personal Model Y, the base rear wheel drive one, is sitting at something like uh, 12 kilowatt hours per 100 Ks. It is an incredibly efficient setup. So yeah, the more you drive it, uh, the more you become comfortable with it, the, the less energy it ends up using. So it's a pretty sort of efficient vehicle to drive. Now there are no drive modes. Um, all you can really sort of select here is acceleration and, and the steering modes. I'll run you through track mode a little later on, but 
Let's go for a little fang around our track here. We do this in all our cars. We'll see how this all feels. Feel for the brakes as well. First corner. All right. So that stability control light flashing already, which is not a good sign. Look, it sits nice and flat through the corners. The steering is incredibly direct. So a tiny bit of steering input is all you need to get this thing to move around. Whoa. Not loving the way this is set up. That high center of gravity is really affecting the way this performs when you hit bumps mid corner. Yeah, because the steering is so direct, it really sort of wallows as it comes through some of these corners. And wow, even there over those tram tracks, it's really not very good in terms of braking performance. You're getting uh, it moving between regen and then the mechanical braking system, and that's causing it to unsettle itself. Let's see what it's like onto our back so I can see that stability control light flashing there again. We'll go hard on the throttle here. Now it'll be interesting to see what happens at the end here. We've got to bump into that braking zone. Hard on the brakes. Wow, <laughs> that is not very good at all. Yeah, this just feels. Yeah, it just doesn't feel right. Um, the Model 3 performance is great because it's got that low center of gravity. It's quick, it's not overly heavy, it does everything great. This, on the other hand, this isn't all that heavy compared to something like an EV6 GT. It's something like 300 kilos less. This tips the scales at just over two tons. But it's the center of gravity that makes this thing just not very impressive when the speed picks up. So you're finding there with that direct steering, it turns in really sharp, but because you've got that that ride that is a mix between firm and floaty, if you do hit a bump mid-corner, it really unsettles the car a lot. And I'm finding the, the same thing here with this brake pedal that I found in my car as well when we went for a fang around here. Because it's not uh, a brake-by-wire system like you're finding in the EV6 GT, when you hit spots like that where you have a bump into a braking zone, it all of a sudden goes from having maximum regen to coming out of regen because the tyres slightly leave the road there. You then need to apply more braking input, which puts more pressure on your, your braking system. Then when it comes back into contact with the road, it goes back into regen. So you're just getting this really unsettling effect as it moves through. And as you can see on those faster corners as well, stability control was constantly biting there. And it really shouldn't do that. And the way that they can fix that is, again, by doing what Hyundai and Kia do, which is fitting an ELSD to the rear axle. Because what it's currently doing is when you tip it into a corner like this and get on the throttle, it's trying to spin up that inside wheel and it's using a braking system to apply a torque vector. And that, that really doesn't work well. So in a high performance car like this, they need a proper electronically controlled limited slip differential to stop it doing that. So obviously uh, you're not going to be driving like this all the time. I totally understand that. But if you do pick up the pace, you want to go to the track or something, this really does feel like it needs a lot of work. And you can see why uh, brands like Hyundai and Kia spend so much time at the Nürburgring because that gives you such a great mix of driving conditions that they can tune those vehicles on. And like we drove um, with the EV6 GT here recently, it is significantly more comfortable on a track like this uh, where the speeds pick up and there are sort of bumps mid corner than this is. So um, yeah, look, quick in a straight line this definitely, but um, it just doesn't feel as settled as it needs to be when the pace picks up through the corners. Now, what about road noise? Um, it is really quiet in here. I was, I was quite surprised by that. It's, um, it's a really nice place to be seated. Even on these sportier tyres, don't have a huge amount of road noise coming into the cabin. It does feel a little boomier than the base model car, but uh, for the most part, it's still a really nice and pleasant experience, even on course chip country roads. Just something else that I wanted to sort of touch on as well, even though this has a significantly bigger battery than the entry level car, it's like 20 kilowatt hours bigger, your actual driving range isn't all that impressive. So they claim uh, over 500 kilometers on the WLTP cycle, but when I had this charged to 100% this morning, it was only showing marginally more mileage than what I would get in my personal car. So my personal car has the LFP battery, this has the lithium ion, uh, this was showing a little under 500 Ks, whereas my car will show 430 when it's full. And the whole concept here as well is that you really only should be charging this to 80 or 90% because uh, the lithium ion batteries don't like being full constantly unless you're doing a road trip. Whereas with the LFP batteries, you should be always charging to 100%. So at 100%, um, I'm showing 430. Here at 100%, I'm showing not much more than that. And then I'd probably be charging this to 80 or 90%, which means you're not actually 
theoretically getting more driving range. It is a, a bit of a mental thing, but um, yeah, the, the added weight you have here really does affect how much driving range you have available. There is a long range version of the Model Y that's just gone on sale that offers significantly more, but then you don't get that performance benefit that you do here. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that uh, this cruise control system doesn't really work that well, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm gonna get up behind Igor, who's in front of me. He's got his cruise set to 70. So you can see we're approaching him. We're predictably slowing down. We've got our cruise set to 80. He's doing 70. I need to pass him now. What would happen normally in a car with radar cruise control, the second I hit the indicator, it would start speeding up because there's no one there, but watch this. Put the indicator on, we're still doing the same speed. So at this point now, I'm holding up traffic and only now is it starting to speed up. We still haven't passed him. And this is all because of the vision system. It's, it's just not letting us achieve what we need to achieve because it just doesn't have a radar to tell it that there's nothing there. So I don't know if that's a confidence thing in their programming, but it's something that definitely needs to be resolved. Okie dokie, time to do a little bit of testing with the lane support systems. Um, we'll see how well this works. Tesla has the best in the business in the sense that um, all of their systems typically work really well. And what we've got here is a simulation of a worst case scenario where the car has to apply a lot of torque to the steering wheel. Had a couple of cars pass here, but a lot of them will fail in the outer lane there where the car has to do all the work. So set so cruise control to 70 kilometers an hour. So here in lane one, it's doing an excellent job. We're staying sort of dead center there. It's applying plenty of steering input. There's no problems there. You can see those lines appearing. We'll jump over to next lane over. Okay, and then set cruise control. So autopilot is active now. It's steering for us. And again, doing an excellent job there, keeping the car pretty much dead center to that lane. Let's see how it goes in the outermost lane. Okay, so set that. Oh. Set it to 70 k's an hour. There we go. Excellent, it is holding that perfectly. So pass in lane one, two, and three. Okay, time to do a little bit of performance testing. So Tesla claims a zero to 100 time of 3.7 seconds. Keep in mind though, that number's a bit, a little bit dodgy because they uh, include a one foot rollout, which means you're deducting the first foot of travel. And that is a drag racing thing. Obviously on the road, it makes, it doesn't make any sense to quote that number. So I suspect the number we're gonna to get to 100 kilometers an hour is going to be uh, slower than that, but we'll see how we go anyway. Uh, we're gonna go all the way through to 120 as well, so we can see what that overtaking time is like. So yeah, everything's ready to go. I'm just gonna slam down the throttle, here we go. Oh yeah, that is nice and quick. All right, this is 100, 120 as well. Very good, all right, we'll come to a stop. Keep in mind as well that uh, with Ohm's law, uh, if you do actually have a fuller battery, it will be quicker because P equals VI, power equals volts times current. So with a uh, fuller battery, you have a higher voltage and that's gonna mean a better acceleration time. So uh, zero to 100, gee, that's not bad, 4.17 seconds, but still well off the claim of 3.7 seconds and then 80 to 120, came in at 2.61 seconds, which is a really good time. It just shows you for overtaking, this is going to feel really nice and sharp for those overtakes. Uh, time to do a break. Let's see how quickly this will stop from 100 k's an hour. Okay, so dial up 100 k's an hour and hit our braking marker, slam down the anchors. Here we go. Ooh. That felt really good. Curious to see what kind of a braking distance we had there. That felt really strong. 2.57 seconds, 36.1 meters. That is impressive, wow. I was not expecting that. So uh, just to put that into context, today we're also testing the Cupra 4 Mentor, which is a small uh, SUV. This way is significantly more than that and has stopped in almost the exact same distance. Um, so yeah, very impressed with that in terms of stopping distance. If you do want to see how this compares to other cars that we've tested in terms of those performance and braking figures, including the EV6 GT, have a look at the link in the description below. And now time for our reverse acceleration test. Let's see how it goes. That's all nice and gentle. Wow, that's very gentle. <laughs> 24 kilometers an hour. 
Okay, so let's chat track mode. Um, so I'm going to put this into park and just show you what it looks like. So if you go over here to uh, rally pedals and steering, track mode, if we go to customize, I'll just show you what it looks like. So uh, Tesla has a couple of presets in there, but I've set up my own. I wrote test and accidentally put a Y there, so let's just do yes. Um, so what you can do is actually set where you want all the torque to go. So you can you know, go full front wheel drive, full rear wheel drive, and then you can set how much stability control intervention you want, along with how much regen braking you want. So keep in mind that if you do want to preserve your brakes, you want regen braking to be at its maximum. And then if you want to do drifty things, you want it to be at its minimum so it doesn't keep cutting in while you're trying to do stuff. Post-drive cooling will run the fans after you're done, and then it also saves dash, dash cans for, for laps as well. Also gives you this really cool display over here. So show you what it looks like. Let's go to all front wheel drive and just see what that feels like. We'll switch track mode on. You have a disclaimer. We enable that. Shows you that everything here is ready to go. I can hear the fans kick on there as well. So right now we're in front wheel drive mode. It actually still accelerates pretty good for front wheel drive mode. So we'll go around our cone here and just gas it. It's kind of very uneventful. It, it spins up that front um, front wheel, but it doesn't, um, doesn't really do a great deal. So it's not uh, all that exciting. So let's do what is exciting, and that is uh, rear wheel drive. So we'll just go all the way to rear wheel drive. Stability control is switched off. And we'll leave regen braking at 5%. Come back now and give this another shot. And can you see how this feels compared to the uh, EV6 GT, which has a drift mode? So tip it into here. It's actually really impressive. It is just so much more gradual and controllable than the, um, than the EV6 GT. So this isn't actually a drift mode. It's not trying to drift. All it's doing is just sending all the torque to the rear. But to me, this feels a lot more controllable and manageable than it did in the EV6. We'll give that another crack. So you can... <laughs> Sick. That was a bit sloppy, but you can actually get a fair bit of steering angle in there. And um, it really is very nice and controllable. So um, yeah, really happy with that. So uh, track mode, you can use it if you want to go to the track. And I think that if you do go to the track, Make sure you have all of this enabled, and I would leave stability control active because it'll still let you have a bit of fun, but then um, step in when it does need to. And probably the best split there as well is gonna be something like 60-40 or 80-20. That'll give you the most fun without destroying your car. Okay, so Tesla Model Y performance. Look, um, just like, like my Model Y, I like the formula. It's got plenty of space. The tech is fantastic, especially that mobile app. It is, it is just sensational. Um, the charging network's great. It does all of that stuff really well. What I was hoping this would be is basically an SUV version of the Model 3 performance. And the Model 3 performance around here was an absolute rocket ship. It was really nice and in control all of the time. This just feels, it just feels all sorts of weird. And I keep referring to Hyundai and Kia. They are sort of in the price bracket of this in terms of performance. And they are both significantly better than this when it comes to handling at speed. Now, if you then want to spend even more money, you look at the other brands that are doing engineering at the Nürburgring, like a BMW with the iX. That is, again, significantly better than this around here. Obviously, much more expensive, but the formula for an EV can be better than what this is. And I think that Tesla needs to really invest in ride and handling, and uh, they need to do that pretty urgently because the rest of the competitors are coming, and they're all offering far better packages that are just a bit more interesting to drive at speed than this. So uh, if it was me and uh, me spending the money, I probably wouldn't bother getting the performance. I would go for the long range. That gives you not only more range, it gives you better performance in the entry level. Yes, it doesn't have track mode and that sort of stuff, but I could probably take or leave that. So um, yeah, my advice, don't get the performance, get the long range or even just the base model. I think it is really good value for money. And with that LFP battery, you can charge it all the way to 100%. So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Have you bought one of these? What has it been like? What do you think of it? Uh, am I wrong? totally wrong let me know your thoughts i'm keen for your feedback if you did enjoy this video please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates and if you haven't done so already subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon but until next time take it easy